Hey, good afternoon everyone. Tractor Man 44 here. Hey, you know, sometimes you get into a situation where you have to get something done that you should have done years ago. Uh, we should have moved our laundry area upstairs many years ago, but we're getting to the point now to where I don't really want the missus to have to go downstairs, even though she hangs clothes out a lot. I don't want her to have to run up and down the steps all the time, you know, doing laundry. So we're moving everything upstairs. I completely finished off a, a room upstairs, you know, uh, specifically for that, but there's no drains, no water, and no electric for the dryer. Uh, in that location. So that's what we're going to kind of do. Now, you know, plumbers have a bad a bad name. They have a name for, for being, you know, charging so much and everything, you know. you got to stop and think what you ask plumbers to do. You know, you ask plumbers to do some of the nastiest things there is to do, you know, when it comes to your sewer systems. You know, so that's worth something because a lot of people, you couldn't pay, pay them enough money to do the things that, that some of the plumbers do in those situations. And then, so many times, plumbers are in spots where you can't hardly do any work. Now, this is kind of tight in here right now. Uh, I'm right up here. I've got to solder these fittings and stuff in that I've just I've just put in place. Uh, and you can see we got plastic pipe here, duct work, and everything here. Um, and it, it's kind of tight, but it's nowhere near as restrictive as a lot of places. I've been underneath schools back in crawl spaces to where I couldn't even turn my head. I'd have to hold my head in the same direction, you know, and then solder right in front of my face with things or up over the top of my head uh, to solder in or silver solder in refrigerant lines or, or plumbing lines, things of that nature, you know, drains and, and everything. So there's a lot of things that come into why plumbers have to charge the things that they charge. But at any rate, we're getting ready to go ahead and fit these guys in and go ahead and solder them in. These are going to extend over hot and cold, go through one of the downstairs closets, penetrate two walls, and then go through the floor, get me hot and cold water up to the uh, to the washing machine. Now I know you guys know there's a um, a lot of tricks to measuring and measuring accurately, but there's also a lot of tricks to preparing your pipe. You know that you got to get that pipe clean whenever you're working with soft solder because any of that uh, impurities and stuff in here will embed itself into the molten solder and it'll be impurities that will cause a leak. So you got to get those sparklings spick and span clean. And then if you know what flux does, whenever you flux the product and then heat it up, if there are any impurities inside, which there really will be some, they will actually, the, fl the flux is responsible for carrying those impurities out as it allows the flow of the solder in. One of the tricks that I'm going to show you guys, and I've done this a few thousand times, Keep two brushes the same size. One of them go ahead and abuse. The other one you keep full size for doing the cups of all the fittings. But the one that you want to abuse, let your brush go inside the pipe. You'll, you'll ruin that brush for doing the cups, but it's really good for doing the pipe. Just put it in there, hold it lightly, and then go ahead and let the pipe spin in your fingers while you lightly hold the sandpaper and clean the end of that pipe off. Works absolutely wonderfully well. So when you get done sanding it and pull out your brush, you have a very, very clean piece of pipe to put your flux on and put your flux 90 right onto the end of it. Hey, let me also stress that even shiny pipe, when you buy it right out of Home Depot, even though it looks nice and clean, it is not. That service is filled with impurities. You, even though the pipe is shiny, you must sand it just as shiny as what I've got these guys right here before you flux them and put them together for your solder joint. If you don't, you will be sorry. Now I told you it was gonna be tight. And it is very tight up in here. here. I'm back here above the top shelf, all the way back in the corner. Getting ready to stick this a little bit. <clears throat> now that's very liberally fluxed on the inside, but this is a turbo torch and it is very loud. This one right here popped back a little bit before I ever started soldering. It's back in the pocket now, so we'll reflux it too. Now the heat's already drawn that flux up in there. I'll let that cool. I'll go ahead and inspect those a little bit. I think it ran around all the way. Bear in mind too, anytime you reheat and try to touch this up, you have to reflux every single time. If you don't, you're going to burn that flux that's remaining in there, or you'll gall that pipe just a little bit with that intense heat, and you'll cause it to not, uh, not seal again. I gotta admit, I kinda had to chuckle with some of the prices that are on some of these older fittings. 
this one here actually has a barcode, so it's not all that old. But this guy here says 19 cents. That tells you how long that, those things have been on the shelf. We'll go ahead and stick these guys here. All right, just a couple more to go over there. Unfortunately, the lines have to come through the downstairs finished area, which is, uh, includes a large cedar lined closet, and then ultimately penetrate a wall out into a finished downstairs bedroom. But at least this will be simple to build a red cedar box around it or a soffit around it. Now that we have the wire lines across and underneath this finished area here, we have to measure out from the wall on the center line dimensions from the downstairs and then blow holes down from the top. But because up here we have to have hose bibs to attach the washing machine to, which is going to be spaced over here about 12 or, or so inches off of the corner, I don't want these fancy little dog-eared fittings that hold your hose bibs just to be screwed into the drywall. It'll be very weak if you have to tighten them up with channel locks or whatever. You don't want to just be tightening up against just drywall anchors. So what I did, I went ahead and opted to finish off a piece of sawmill lumber, planed it down and round over it and everything. Now I've got it. Uh, secured to the wall with a 3 16 inch toggle, toggle bolts and these are going to be screwed into here if you notice I got a little bit of offset made already for the plumbing pipe so those are going to be screwed into here give a good secure base and now what we're doing is we're locating the holes down here at the bottom on the on center dimension where they're at downstairs in the basement now you got to be prepared for that because you know you got a finished area downstairs you have typically two by ten floor joists and uh, two by ten floor joists is going to be nine and a quarter inches by nine, nine and a half inches Plus you got your drywall, plus you got your three thicknesses now of floor up here. So you have to have a drill bit that's pretty long. You can take you a good piece of tool steel and actually braze or weld a normal drill bit right onto a piece of tool steel. And then as long as you do it accurately, you've got a nice straight drill bit that's going to extend that distance that you need. Remember we have 10 millimeter uh, top floor. We have a, uh, a 5 8 uh, yellow pine board on top of 3 quarter inch subfloor. So that's what we have to go through before we get to the 9 and a quarter inch cavity that goes down to the drywall. We're in the cavity. And there's the drywall. Well with a little luck on measuring Everything worked out just about where we wanted to. So now I gotta go ahead and put the uh, hose bibs right onto the fittings right there. So we'll go ahead and tighten this down, put the second one on, we'll be back. So next we gotta move the wash machine in and then figure out what we're gonna do with the drain and the uh, and the vent. Hey guys, I gotta tell you something. I've gotta be the most forgetful YouTuber that there is. I completely forgot I was doing a video on this installation. Once I got done with the plumbing and everything, I just kept on going with the, the wiring preparations and the duct and then just realized Man, I, I completely skipped a bunch of stuff. I've got the standpipe in. I've got the standpipe with the P-trap going outside. I've got the wiring here that I do not have connected up yet. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. But you can see we got uh, THHN pulled through uh, Greenfield Conduit, flexible aluminum conduit. And we're ready right now to go ahead and go through the wall. I've actually completely gone through the wall. So we're ready to put the piece of pipe through. That in and of itself is a trick because you got to remember you got studs in there. And uh, you got to make sure that you miss those studs because there's no way you can take a hole saw and go through a 2x6 stud because this particular port, this addition, is all 2x6 stud. I've got that hole all the way through and you can see the packed cellulose insula insulation. So this should go in right here. Now what I have to do is go outside and push that up just a little bit inside of flush so that I can slide this damper right here, this little back graph damper, right on top of it. And then this will remain flush with the outside wall. Now what my plan is, is to have hard pipe off the back of the dryer, hard pipe through the wall, and then right here across where the plumbing is and where I may have to get in and do some work, I'm going to use the flexible, a sharp piece of flex right here to align everything up. Plus it'll be easy to remove 
and allow me to go ahead and clean the duct and everything you know, whenever necessary. And if I have a problem with the water circuit, it'll be simple to pull this off to where I can get in here and do, do some work on that. So this is only going to insert in about so far to give me plenty of access. Okay, the little damper is permanently installed outside on the siding. It's about, uh, it's about 14 feet up from the ground. So now we're on to the electrical for now. Now all the new houses being built are, are coming in with a four wire service. In other words, you have 240 volt single phase on two hot legs. You have a neutral for that 240 volt that'll, the, that will give you 110 to the, to the neutral. Then you also have the mechanical ground. Uh, in the old days, the mechanical ground and the, uh, the neutral was typically tied onto the same bus bar. Uh, whether or not you had the bus bar bonded to the panel or not. Uh, we can go into tremendous detail on that. I'm not the one to do that, uh, so I'm not going to tell you all that stuff. But essentially we have a four wire system here that actually comes on the new dryer. And so we're going to go ahead and hook that into the panel box, just like it's supposed to be, uh, as though we had a four wire service entrance. But this is an older house. We built it in 1980, and it does have the three wire coming in. Well, the project is now complete. And the reason we did it like this is because this hides everything completely back in the corner. Now this is an LG product. I believe it's made in South Korea, but it's stackable. And if you take a look right in between, you can see the brackets that actually by four screws uh, actually uh, physically attach the two components together. Very, very nice and stable. If you notice, the wash machine actually has lifting pockets down here. You can see very, very close to the bottom. That's really nice because it is a heavy machine. But there's nothing, uh, no provisions for lifting on the dryer. But it doesn't matter. The dryer is very simple and very, it's very light. Obviously, you can see the uh, the washer in motion, so it's in operation. That's about our third load of clothes. But we've not used the dryer yet because I just finished wiring it in just literally moments ago. So it's about ready to fire that up. Now, if you notice back in the corner, I've got the uh, the water lines coming up, and then the flexible electrical conduit very in close proximity. You have to check with your local codes to see if there's any restrictions. My particular code doesn't give virtually any restrictions at all governing this particular application. But what I'm doing, just for the heck of it, I've got the circuit tied to a 30 amp ground fault GFCI circuit breaker down at the power panel in the basement. So uh, if there's ever an issue, we have absolutely nothing to worry about. Now the reason we went with the stackable unit uh, is for the space consideration. If you notice, we've got a nice wide spot in the middle. That's about 52 or 53 inches right there. And you'll note that uh, there's uh, eight foot tall stacks of, of reeds with different sizes and shapes of reeds, uh, hand, basket handles, and also uh, basket bases. Uh, the missus is quite the accomplished basket maker, and that's the way we keep those organized. And this used to be her reed room, but the space now in between the reed uh, compartment and the uh, wash and dryer, we're going to transfer our, our small chest type freezer in here. I think it's like 47 inches in width. Like, like I always say, I don't do how-to videos, but I hope you got a little bit of insight as to what to expect when you have to install a washer and dryer in an area in your house that does not have the proper plumbing, but now you know kind of what you have to go through to get plumbing there. You have to be a little creative and also get electric here from your, uh, from your pound box. So everything's in full, full operation. All I've got to do is cut the door off, rehang the door, and uh, we're going to go on to the next project, which is going to be building a set of shelves and everything for storage on the other side of the room. So you know what? This is Tractor Man 44, and I'm out of here, guys. <laughs>